it's possible to derive all the Buddhist teachings from his awakening. That's why the Buddha's awakening is the object of our conviction. We're convinced that he, through his own powers, gained awakening. And what he saw in the course of his awakening has information that can give us guidance in how we can run our lives, even today, 2,600 years plus later. But we have to keep in mind that the Buddha told us only a very little bit about his awakening. There are the three main knowledges, knowledges of his, knowledge of his past lifetimes, knowledge of how beings are born after they die in line with their karma, and the knowledge of how to put it into effluence. In other words, how to get rid of the defilements of the mind to keep you bound to this process of samsara. It was a result of that last knowledge that he, the Buddha gained unbinding. In the case of the first two knowledges, he gives only a sketch. You remember that story about the handful of leaves? That what he tells us was just a handful of leaves, whereas what he learned was like all the leaves in the forest. And what he tells us about his first knowledge is enough to give rise to a sense of sangwega. He didn't go into all the details about how he'd been a king many times. Occasionally, after that, he would mention this. But again, only brief mentions. The important thing is, what is life? You take on an identity, you have a certain appearance and a name. You belong to a class of beings, and you have experiences of pleasure and pain. You eat certain food, and then you die. That's it. And you do that over and over and over again. That's the information you conveyed, again, for the purpose of Sangwega. Later on in his teaching career he would elaborate, but again, it was all for the purpose of Sangwega. Think about the simile with the ocean. The tears you've shed over your many, many lifetimes is more than all the water in the oceans. And that's just, say, over the death of your mother. For the death of your father, you've shed tears more than the water in all the oceans. Over the death of a son, more than all the waters in the oceans. The death of a daughter, a brother, a sister. And this reflection on how it would be hard to meet someone who hadn't been a mother or father, daughter, sister, son, brother was not meant to encourage thoughts of goodwill for everybody, because after all, we know what family life is like. It has its positive and its negative sides. But just the fact that you've had those relationships so many times, and then they end and they get scattered apart. You meet people. You have to think, this person was my mother at some point, and now this person is a total stranger. It's meant to give for us again to Sangwega for a desire for release. So when you look at the Buddhist teachings, ask, what are they intended to inspire in you? In this case, Sangwega. The same with the second knowledge. Beings are reborn in line with their karma. Their karma is influenced by their views. And their views are influenced by whom they respect. And that can take you all over this many, many levels of the cosmos. The Buddha very rarely goes into detail about what he saw that night and how many levels there are. He gives a broad sketch, but he doesn't give us a census. In the Mahasamaya Sutta, where they do give a list of all the devas who came to see him one night. He says, these are not all the devas in the universe. Most of them came. And again, they're listed as groups, as types, in addition to the naming of some individuals. It would be hard to go any place in the world where you wouldn't find the local deities and local spirits 
falling into one of those types. One of the interesting developments in the history of Buddhism after the Buddha was this desire to fill in all the details, to paint a complete picture of the cosmos. There's a book out, I think it's called The Buddhist Cosmos, which talks about the beliefs that developed over time. It doesn't make much distinction between which parts come from the canon, which parts come from the commentaries and later, later texts, which is a shame because the in interest in all those different levels seems to go beyond what the Buddha intended, which is to simply think that no matter how good it gets within the realm of fabrication, it's all going to end. You become a deva, you become a brahma. You think that you're the creator of the universe, even. And then you fall from that and you become an ordinary being of one kind or another. And you think about all the work that's done to get up to those high levels. And the people, when they get to the high level, they get the rewards of their good actions. But their rewards, even though they're pleasant, can spoil them. As I said before, samsara is like a sick joke. You work hard to get up, and then the very rewards of your good actions turn on you. So again, the purpose of all this is to get a sense of sangwe, to get a sense that you really want to get out. Another one of the strange developments over time. We should get some deities to say, no, they're not just regular deities, they're actually bodhisattvas, and they're going to teach you the special secret doctrine that the Buddha didn't teach. And it's special and secret, and it's very much different from what the Buddha taught. I'm claiming that that's a sign of how special it is. Of course, these, these deities don't come with identity cards. There's no certification agency. So you have to regard that with suspicion. The Buddha said if the Dharma is something that's in line with what he taught. For example, he taught that things arise and pass away. Later teachers came out and said, no, nothing arises, nothing passes away. It's all a great oneness. Over things, a great oneness, what are we doing here? As the Buddha said, the things that arise and pass away, especially suffering, it is real. Not other than what it seems, it really is suffering. The cause of suffering really is a cause of suffering. And the path really is the path. And the cessation of suffering to which that path leads, that's the highest noble truth. That's what the Buddha discovered on his third knowledge of the night. He was able to discover it because he didn't get waylaid by the kinds of questions that normally would waylay people. There are many people who, prior to the Buddha, had seen their previous lifetimes, had seen beings dying and being reborn, but they would come to ask the question, well, what is it that stays the same as beings change from one life to the next? Then it turned into a question of identity. The Buddha saw, well, the issue really is the actions. And he looked in more detail on the actions. That's how he arrived at the principle that when you pass away, it's not just your cumulative karma from the past, it's choices you make at the moment of death. Will determine where you go. The combination of the two. It's just not just the moment of death that's important. It's every moment you're, you're making choices. Well, if that's the case, then he could look at the present moment in his own mind and see what choices he was making. And now he might make some choices that would lead to the end of suffering. And he saw that if you divided experience into four categories, Suffering, its cause, the cessation of suffering and the path leading there, without reference to who was doing it or where it was happening. That's how you could get out. 
by comprehending the suffering, by abandoning the cause, realizing the cessation and developing the path there. Now that was the part of his teaching that he taught in a lot of detail. Again and again and again. Either he talks about the suffering and goes into the five aggregates and what clinging is, or he goes into the different types of craving, or he goes into the factors of the path. Particularly the factors of the path, because those are the things that are going to get you out. So you should think about the Buddha's awakening and what it means to have conviction there. Remember the huge focus is on that third knowledge. That's where all the details come. The other two are more for background. And as I said, they're just a sketch. There are very few stories of the Buddha's previous lifetimes in the parts of the canon that seem to be original. The Jataka tales are in the commentary, and even the verses that are associated with them, even though they are on the canon, they seem to be a much later edition, because that's not where the real issue lies. As the Buddha said, the parts he taught about his awakening, the Four Noble Truths, were for the sake of getting people to come to the end of suffering. You focus on that, and you're focusing on the right spot. Which is why we're here, meditating, developing one of the factors of the path, right mindfulness, right concentration, or at the very least trying to. But by doing this, we're putting ourselves in the same spot where the Buddha was. That's the other part about that. The Buddha's awakening and having conviction in it. As he said, it came from developing qualities that any human being can develop. And so we're going to learn the truth about the awakening, not by reading the books, but by developing those qualities in our own minds. and listening to the advice that he gave, and how we can apply those qualities so we can get the same results that he did. This is a point that you hear again and again in the forest tradition, even though as followers of the Buddha we may not have the same breadth of knowledge that he gained, but the purity of mind that can be attained. That's the same for everybody. And you know whether that's true or not only if you really give yourself to the path, which demands that you learn how to be very observant. So by the forest masters don't explain everything. There's a passage. I found it with a John John, he had a Western disciple, who was always asking questions. What's this? What this? What does this mean? What does that mean? And John John said, it's like a father getting questions from a, getting from, from a child, asking, what's this animal? What's that animal? And the father will answer for a while. But then he'll get to a point he says, well, you've got to figure this out on your own. Because it's only in exercising your own ingenuity that you're going to develop the discernment you need. It's not a matter of paint, paint by number. The Buddha developed discernment, he developed concentration. You've got to develop those same qualities. They're the two qualities that the Buddha said were necessary for every, every follower in the path. was said that you, one, be honest, and two, be observant. You commit yourself to the path, and then you reflect on what you're doing. And that's how you come to know. <laughs>